Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she, hers, and I'll be keeping an eye out for all of your questions about those interesting invertebrates today. If you're watching on Zoom, you can ask those questions by heading to the Q&A button at the bottom and typing them in. You can also include your name and age so that we can give you a shout out if we get to your questions. If you'd like to see captions, please click on the CC or closed captions button at the bottom of your screen. And at this point, I will invite our educators to turn on their cameras and introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcus. My pronouns are he, him. And my favorite invertebrate group would have to be spiders. It's one that we think of a lot when we hear the word inver invertebrate, among others. And I personally used to be terribly afraid of spiders. But then after I started to, to learn more about them, get to know them better, I really developed an interest and an affinity towards arachnids in general. And so they're my favorite invertebrate. Hi, everybody. My name is Matt. My pronouns are he and him. It's very hard to choose a single invertebrate. So I'll tell you one of my favorite groups, which are the echinoderms. One of the things I like about echinoderms is that unlike many other kinds of animals that have what we call bilateral symmetry, where one side is a mirror image of the other, echinoderms have radial symmetry, which means that they have different branches radiating out from a central hub. And you can see that same form in many different kinds. So they're cool. And hi, everyone. My name is Megan, I use the pronoun she, hers, and my favorite invertebrate is the periwinkle snail. Um, and if you live here on the Northeast of the US and have had the chance to go to the Atlantic Ocean and maybe into some tide pools, you've probably seen thousands of them all connected onto the rocks, sort of uh, moseying along. And I love them just because my childhood memories of being on the beach in Rhode Island where I grew up, uh, they were just really a part of it and really started my love for nature. Thanks everyone, great to meet you. Uh, so Clement, who is nine, has the same question that I do actually, which is what is an invertebrate? What are we talking about today? This is a great question, a perfect question to start with. What is an invertebrate? And an invertebrate is an animal that very simply does not have a backbone. So if you take your hand and you put it toward your back and you can kind of feel all those lumpy bumpies right in the middle, that is your backbone or spine. And that is what makes you a vertebrate. Um, but we're talking about invertebrates here. So those are creatures that do not have that backbone. And sort of surprisingly, they make up 97% of life uh, on earth as we know it. So a lot of creatures do not have a backbone like we do. And those are invertebrates. Are there any invertebrates that are closer to vertebrates in this giant tree of life than others? I'll take that. Um, there are an interesting little group of animals called tunicates that are actually classified loosely as invertebrates, but they're in a way they're more closely related to animals with backbones um, like humans. Um, tunicates as a larva develop a something called a notochord, which can almost be thought of as a, the, the young version of a spinal cord. Now they lose it eventually. They actually become sessile. In fact, I've got a picture of what a colony of these creatures look like. They are very, very pretty. Let me just show that to you really quick. And what you're looking at here, each one of these circles you see is an individual tunicate. They're sometimes also called sea squirts, sea peaches. There's quite a few different species, but this is a whole bunch of them that are growing together as a sort of mat. So again, when they're young, when they're larvae, they're actually free swimming through the water and they do have something that's a little bit um, like, a, like an early version of a spinal cord, but they lose that spinal cord and they never develop the bones that we do around it. Matt, thanks so much. I think maybe that answers my next question, but if you could clarify, uh, is it possible for invertebrates to have a spinal cord, even if they don't have those bones? The only one I'm aware of is the tunicate. And again, what they have isn't really quite a spinal cord. It's called a notochord. And again, it's like an embryonic version, but that one feature is so important that it's completely upended how we used to classify these animals. Um, colleagues, are you familiar with anything else? No, that sounds not, good to me. No, not that I'm aware of. Why don't invertebrates need spines? Kind of a big question. 
we can talk about what they what they have and what helps them. Uh, so a lot of invertebrates have an exoskeleton, which is made of a material called chitin. Um, and that material is really what holds their body together. It gives them structure. Uh, so a lot of uh, invertebrates are insects and insects have that exoskeleton that sort of keeps them together. Along with arachnids uh, have that exoskeleton. There are some exceptions. I'm thinking of uh, like slugs, for example, don't have that very hard chitin outside, um, but that's something that helps give them structure. Also, a lot of invertebrates are incredibly small um, and their sort of body position isn't necessarily like straight up and fighting gravity. It's very much uh, parallel to the ground. Um, so that, that sort of helps them along that way too, but I'm sure there's other reasons. Marcus, Matt, any thoughts? Just to kind of add on to what uh, Megan was saying, we have a spinal cord and invertebrates might have an exoskeleton because those are su supporting structures for their body. They're just two different ways to go about supporting your organs or the muscles or whatever you have in your body. And there are, there are multiple ways to achieve that support. So exoskeleton might be one way and the spinal cord is another. And there, again, those are just two different ways to actually be a, a large multi or relatively large multicellular or, organism. We do have some questions about specific animals or types of animals. So one is, are lobsters invertebrates? think related to what we were just talking about. Is one of you more of a lobster expert than me or should I jump on it? All okay. you. Go for so it. lobsters absolutely are invertebrates. Now, um, Marcus's favorite group that he mentioned earlier are the arthropods. And arthropods are basically animals that have a jointed skeleton. That's what the word arthropod means. Now I'm actually gonna show a picture of a crab, which isn't the same as a lobster, but it's in the same group. And, base, and um, this is an example of one of those arthropods um, that have this exoskeleton made of pieces of chitin, which is what Megan mentioned. And you can see places where that chit those chitinous uh, sections are jointed together. So crabs, lobsters, insects, arachnids, also animals like millipedes, it goes on and on. Um, arthropods are a humongous group. They make up the bulk of the invertebrates and insects alone make up, uh, there's, three times as many insects as there are all the other kinds of invertebrates combined. So an incredibly successful group. Um, but yes, lobsters and other kinds of crustaceans are a subgroup of the arthropods and they're definitely invertebrates. And something really- oh, we, go for sorry, it, sorry, sorry, Katie. Uh, something really cool that we saw in the picture that Matt showed us is that they have that joint, those jointed segments. And what's really cool about the chitin exoskeleton Perfect, yeah. So you see those segments and you see those kind of blue spots between those segments of chitin. And those are the places where the animal can actually move, the joints. And they absolutely need those parts because chitin is very inflexible. And it's a supporting structure that doesn't really grow as the animal on the inside grows. So a lot of arthropods uh, that have an exoskeleton, they have to molt. They have to get rid of that outer shell and then they can start growing a new one that will fit their new body. And it turns out that molting, that process of changing your exoskeleton actually has a very high mortality rate for a lot and a lot of invertebrates. It's surprisingly high. I read one statistic, it was almost 90% because in that state, they don't have that protective outer shell, that support system. And so they're very easy pickings for predators. They might get trapped in that small exoskeleton as well. So just a very, very interesting way that they have evolved to survive today. Obviously it's been very successful since they've been around for hundreds of millions of years. Thank you. So another specific question we have is are reptiles invertebrates? And Clement, again, would like to know if snakes are invertebrates. So snakes are a type of reptile and reptiles are vertebrates. So they do in fact have backbones. I know snakes in particular, they just sometimes seem like this very wormy creature and so flexible that they can't possibly have those rigid bones inside of them that, that we do, but they actually have hundreds of bones and that's the reason why they're so flexible. So they do have a backbone. Uh, so that, that puts them with us in the vertebrate uh, category. <laughs> awesome, thank you. From Bronwyn, any guesses for how many kinds of invertebrates there are? 
Uh, the last, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll just say there are over 1 million species that we've discovered so far. And a lot of estimates show that, um, or many scientists believe that there could be five to 10 million out there simply because they tend to be a lot smaller than vertebrates in many cases. And so it's not as easy to find them. They're everywhere. And sometimes we're discovering new species. We used to think that one group was one species when sometimes there were two different ones. We're discovering new species every single day because we might think of one animals a different way or we just might find something new altogether. And a lot of invertebrates, they might live in the deep ocean. Marcus is really excited about this. So <laughs> give him a second. Oh, sorry, I disconnected there. What, what happens with invertebrates in the deep ocean? Oh, thank, thank you, Katie. Uh, there just tends to be a lot of animals down there that we haven't discovered yet because it's so, so, so hard to reach. And so it's just one of those things where there are definitely more species out there. We just haven't discovered them all yet. We might not ever discover them all. Thank you. Uh, I also have my own personal question that I'm going to throw in. So when I think of humans and how we move and how many vertebrates move, so much I think depends on our vertebrae and our spinal cord. So for these animals that don't have that, how do they move around? Can I start that one? Um, the, the, it depends a lot on exactly how they're built because there are different kinds of exoskeletons, but also as Megan mentioned, some animals, uh, some invertebrates are basically supported by water inside their bodies. They have what are called hydrostatic skeletons. So those animals basically have big pockets of water. You can almost imagine that inside their body are lots and lots of tiny water balloons. And while we use muscles between bones, mine are disappearing because of the green screen effect, um, but we use muscles between our bones to draw bones together or to push them apart. Um, basically, invertebrates that have these hydrostatic skeletons will use the muscles to pull and push these sacks of water apart. So that can allow them to sometimes to push themselves through the water, to extend a tentacle. Um, it works surprisingly well. Thank you. Thank you for answering my question too, in addition to everyone else's. Uh, so we have a lot of, we're getting to what is the largest invertebrate animal? What is the smallest invertebrate animal? I can take the smallest. I'll go with the smallest. So the smallest is what's called a rotifer. So these are incredibly small invertebrates that you can really see with a microscope. Um, they're measured at about 0 0.002 inches. Yes, this is a picture of one. So incredibly tiny and relatively simple animals. Um, they even, they live in often, I believe freshwater bodies exclusively, although I could be wrong there, but they certainly live in freshwater bodies. And if you live in Massachusetts and near Boston, they're actually in the Charles River. So uh, pretty cool creatures and very small. Uh, the largest one, unfortunately, does not live in the Charles River. The largest one would be the giant squid, not the colossal squid, the giant squid. And they can get up to the size of about a school bus in length, sometimes 30, some estimates like 46 feet sometimes, and they can weigh over a thousand pounds. And those animals are much larger than a lot of even vertebrates, but they live in the ocean where the water really supports their body weight and their body structure. They don't really have a rigid skeleton like us, so they'd have a really hard time moving outside of the water. But those animals tend to be preyed upon by vertebrates like sperm whales. And so you might've heard of sperm whales eating giant squid and that relationship certainly is real just in the ocean. Thank you. Uh, how do those jellyfish eat? Or I would say any jellyfish. I can, I, can, I can float that. Um, so jellyfish basically have two things they got to do. The first is they've got to kill something and then they've got to eat it. Now the eating part's actually pretty straightforward. Um, basically jellyfish are kind of a big sack. 
there's only one opening. They have to eat and poop through the same hole, unfortunately. And, you know, when they're ready to eat something, they can basically, yep, nice job, yep. <laughs> and that's right, I've got a picture of these too. Um, when they're ready to eat something, they basically can draw it inside. Hang on, I got a jellyfish somewhere. Um, and then, you know, they've got enzymes similar to what's inside our stomach that can break that down. So in this case, you know, the opening for this animal is down here in the middle uh, inside all those flaps. Now, the more interesting part though is how some jellies actually get their food. There's variations. Some jellies are filter feeders. They basically just suck stuff up. Um, but of course, one of the things that's famous about many jellies is they have tentacles of a sort. Um, and those tentacles are loaded with tiny little cells called nematocysts. And you can almost think of these nematocysts as being little venom filled darts. So if this jelly had long tentacles, I don't think this particular species does, um, but they would drape down in through the water being almost invisible. And any fish that would swim through might blunder into a tentacle and trigger these little nematocysts to shoot out and either kill or stun the fish by injecting venom inside. And once that happens, the jelly can then sort of use the tentacles to bring the, the fish up and into its mouth so it can eat it. By the way, notice I said jellies. Um, jellyfish is a term that technically speaking, we're trying to get away from just because they're not particularly closely related to fish. But it's one of those things we're stuck with a lot in biology, so. Same with starfish, right? It's trying yeah, to move exactly. to sea stars. <laughs> mm -hmm. I actually have a question here. Are sea stars invertebrates? And is that why they can regrow limbs? They, they are invertebrates, yeah. And Matt had, had mentioned them earlier, I believe with uh, echinoderms, right? So it's a pretty neat group of animals and they can regrow their limbs. And if I'm not mistake, mistaken, I learned this a long time ago, but it has a little bit to do with the, the, their anatomy and sort of the layers of their anatomy. So it's not so much that their heart is located in or if they even have a heart, I'm not even sure, but if a certain organ is in one arm versus another organ in another arm, that wouldn't work too well for being able to grow back limbs. And I believe that with their anatomy, it's more in layers so that uh, it's sort of like a cake um, so that when a limb does disappear, they have all of the essential layers still there and they can kind of just grow out from that location uh, rather than losing important pieces along the way. But I don't know if that if that's helpful. <laughs> that's me uh, sort of just recalling what I learned a long time ago. <laughs> What kind of defense mechanisms do invertebrates have? Ooh. Want to each take one? Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I'm just thinking of bees. I got, I got bees on my sweater here right now. So they have a great defense mechanism that a lot of you are maybe familiar with or have even experienced, I certainly have, um, is that they can sting. So uh, bees are insects, so they're part of the arthropod grouping and uh, they use their venom to protect themselves. And another really cool one, this is kind of a two-parter for tarantulas, is when they get scared, they might rear up and show their fangs. They're large for, for uh, invertebrates of their size, so that can be really scary for a lot of animals, including us. I mean, for a lot of us, even the sight of a spider is enough for us to go running. But if you further try to get closer to a tarantula, it might not necessarily bite, but it will rub the hairs on its abdomen so that the uh, little hairs start floating in the air and if they get on their skin, it gets quite irritating. It's not really harmful, even if you breathe it in, it's just very, very irritating, you might start coughing, but that will keep away a lot of very large animals. So it's a great defense mechanism that this relatively small invertebrate has to ward off large predators like humans. And this, this is a tough one because the variation in defense mechanisms in invertebrates is just beyond belief. But um, I'm going to go with the sea cucumber. Sea cucumbers are another kind of echinoderm. They're another one of these animals with radial symmetry. They look like kind of a little squat football um, with five rows of tiny little tube feet sticking out of them so they can kind of inch along in the water. And at least some of them have an absolutely remarkable um, defense mechanism. Um, if something comes up that's threatening them or trying to eat them, um, they basically go Bleh! and vomit out their guts on whatever is in front of them. So this is not only just gross, but the guts also are sticky. So imagine you're a fish, you're about to eat this delicious sea cucumber, and all of a sudden the front opens up and Bleh! you're covered with like lots of intestines and things. Generally, the fish is going to swim away and think better of it. And this is another example of regeneration. The, the uh, sea cucumber 
obviously wouldn't last very long if it couldn't regenerate its inside. So they actually do grow back. And, and just to work off what Matt was saying is like they, invertebrates have so many different defenses. I think a great question would to ask would be, what don't they do in defense? Mm -hmm. Because there's just so many of them. If we have an idea of how to escape a predator, chances are some kind of invertebrate tried it out at some point in time, simply because there are so many. They're so variable in size and abilities. It's honestly so fascinating. And speaking of some time ago, is it true that dragonflies used to be six feet long? I'll expand that to, uh, were insects really actually giant in ancient times? I know there were some big dragonflies. Meganura was one of them. Uh, I think it was that six feet measurement was probably their wingspan rather than their length. Um, but don't like give me, I'm gonna take the caveat that this is something I learned about 20 years ago. But yes, um, there were some very large ins insects um, that early on. Um, I think at least one of the theories about why that was so at the time was because the oxygen percentage of the atmosphere was greater. Is that, does that track colleagues? Uh, that okay. sounds familiar to me. Because um, one of the issues that insects have is unlike um, you know us, we breathe in through lungs that can process a lot of oxygen. Um, insects have a, a, a much simpler process. They basically have holes in their body uh, that oxygen can sort of flow into in a very kind of gradual way. Um, so now with our, you know, lower oxygen percentage in the atmosphere, there's a limit to how big insects can grow. And it is almost entirely based on um, how quickly oxygen get inside all their tissues. Otherwise they'd basically rot from the inside out. Wow. Um, we have another question going back underwater. Um, I heard that coral are actually animals and would they be invertebrates? Yes and yes. So corals are, are living things. Uh, you think of the coral reef that we often refer to that you can see from space. Uh, yeah, that is a, a living organism. A uh, very simple organism, but it's incredibly important, especially when we think of coral reefs. They're the very foundation of a lot of other species that live in the ocean. And uh, they're certainly sort of reaching our headlines lately in, in the wake of climate change and how warming waters are really impacting their ability to, uh, to survive. And they're doing what's called bleaching. Um, so they're sort of losing their color and uh, definitely struggling in those warmer waters. But I don't know any more about that, Marcus and Matt, do you have anything that you'd like to add? I can add a bit. Marcus, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, I, corals are certainly animals. Um, the colors that we see actually come from a relationship that they have with the kind of algae that will give the coral energy through photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is the same process that plants, trees, um, gain energy from the sunlight and turn it into energy that the animal or plant could use to grow. And so a lot of the algae that lives with the coral in its structure give the coral its energy and that allows the coral to grow and provide shelter to a lot of other animals, not just invertebrates, but also vertebrates like fish and even snakes, sea snakes. And so like Megan was saying, a lot of that color can disappear through the gradual rise in temperatures thanks to climate change. But it's just fascinating how diverse a coral reef could be and how it's the foundation for a lot of ecosystems. And the only thing I'll add to that is, as Megan mentioned, when you look at a coral reef, you're not looking at a single animal, you're looking at a massive colony of trillions of tiny animals. In fact, coral polyps are related to the jellies that are behind me back there, um, and also sea anemones. Now jellies and sea anemones have those hydrostatic skeletons I mentioned. They basically are um, using you know, water sacs in their body and the action of muscles between them to act as a sort of a skeleton to give them structure. Corals, on the other hand, actually do create an exoskeleton using something called calcium carbonate, which is the same material you find in mollusk shells. So when you look at a coral reef, you're looking at you know, layers and layers of uh, mostly dead animals you know, that secreted these calcium carbonate exoskeletons and then new ones grew on top and they grew their own and then new ones grew on top and they grew their own and they just stack up over time to make these massive structures. Thanks. I think we have time for one last question here. Uh, and I am going to choose, what does the inside of a snail look like? 
That's a great question. I don't know if I've ever seen the inside of a snail. I'm wondering the same thing. Have either of you ever seen that type of specimen? Not recently. When I was a kid, I'm sure I did, but I don't remember now. What would a snail look like without its shell, maybe? A slug. Yeah. <laughs> Slugs and snails are very close related. It's just that snails, as part of their evolutionary path, um, started growing that shell, um, you know, which, which you know, they, they can add to over time. That's why it gets that coiled shape, because it gets bigger and bigger. Um, so, and, and there is a piece of the snail's body that sort of grows into the shell and secretes it and sort of anchors it. But yeah, they kind of look like a naked slug. Well, on that note, uh, thank you so much to our scientists today for answering all of these amazing questions. At this point, I will invite our scientists to uh, say a quick goodbye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. And thank you all so much for joining us and being amazing scientists as well, asking those amazing questions. If you enjoyed today's program, you can check out more and what's happening in the future by visiting www.mos.org slash MOS at home. And if you really enjoyed this program and want to help us keep doing them, please support the museum by visiting engage.mos.org slash welcome. Thanks again so much, everyone. We'll see you next time.